just had a moment backstage where I was really jealous of all of you, um, not for what you have in your hands, etc. But um, just being in this, getting to see Robert and all the speakers I got through that are coming. I remember how when I was a, a technologist 20 years ago, had no idea what design was, and to get to learn design, that feels pretty cool. So I was jealous. I wish I was here 20 years later, but I can't do that. Um, and 20 years ago, I was trying to understand design. Um, I learned about design from a guy named Paul Rand about one of his books. And I didn't know what it meant, so I went to art school to study design. And design is really confusing uh, in the old way. Um, there's everything, there's like form follows function, function follows form, there's all these people that were like the Turing of that era in design. And I really struggled to figure it out. Uh, but what, the one thing I did come upon was how design and computing didn't really connect at all. That this thing called uh, computation and design didn't really fit so well together. So I focused a lot on that um, in that era. And because PostScript was out, I began to write code uh, to create images. And this is when I was in art school in 1991. Uh, I was trying to reconcile two books, the, the List Machine Manual, with the nice help out of the cover, uh, with that house book also a Helvetica cover. So I was trying to do a peanut butter and chocolate move to figure out how to make a Reese's moment. Now, I began to make things like this to understand the computer. I took my mouse and glued every icon from Photoshop and everything to, to understand the mouse because the mouse seems so simple, but it's actually so complex. It does so many things. It's very deceptive. And when I was listening to Robert backstage, I was thinking about how when he was saying about fashion, I realized that uh, design is both superficial and substantive at the same time. So you have these crossing of moments that <coughs> makes design hard to uh, make happen, and also hard to understand. But when it clicks, it feels it feels really good. And and so I would make many things for different clients in Japan, uh, Shiseido, Sony, places like that in the '90s to try to understand how to mix these two things together. And um, didn't turn out right all the time. Uh, but thanks to the web, it became useful and interesting to more people. Um, but the problem with making things with a computer in the 90s was people would always call me the eye candy guy. Eye candy, sort of pejorative. Candy, you know, candy, sweet, not important. Ah, it's you. You make things that aren't very useful. And it kind of hurt me. So I said instead, I make eye meat. <laughs> but when I said this, I wasn't sure what that meant myself, and so I tried to go on a journey to figure out what I need was. And uh, this was in the 90s, and I had a bunch of great professors, and, and uh, they all told me that I would never know if I'm any good or not if I didn't make people who could do the same thing, who could mix uh, design and technology, uh, code and design. And so I joined the faculty at the MIT Media Lab in the 90s and began a hunt for people that could do both. And um, now I know this terminology for the both people. They're uh, the unicorns, they're the artists who can code. So I was hunting unicorns on the web all the time. Hey, want to come to MIT, graduate school, free, really? Um, and I would also find ninjas. Ninjas are the coders who are artists also. So I would hunt for unicorns and ninjas uh, as my uh, main focus, uh, bringing together people that can code and do art, and just kind of make it like it's a natural thing, which today, as we know, it's very normal. Um, but what happened is, um, as I was making all this stuff, kind of cross art and design, technology, and engineering, I was at this conference where um, I spoke after a very famous illustrator in the 70s, one of America's most important illustrators, New Yorker covers, things like that. And uh, his work was beautiful. He sat down, we all applauded, I got up, I showed my computer things, and I sat down, they're all applauding for me, and then this man leans over to me and whispers, and he says to me, your work is beautiful, but it is so empty. <laughs> and everyone's applauding for me, and I'm like, this guy says I'm it's empty. Uh, and I thought about that, and I thought, what do you mean? And I thought about it, it really seriously, and I realized that a lot of my work was trying to understand this intersection of technology and art. So trying to figure this intersection out. What is technology's relationship to art? And I realized that a lot of what I was in 
thinking about it was I wasn't thinking about that all important word, empathy, which grounds all of design, all of art, people. Because empathy is not about technology, it's about people. And I was reading that great book by the, uh, the uh, uh, David and Tom Kelly, the new book called Creative Confidence, and there's a, a little section about uh, a professor at uh, Stanford, Dan Rome, um, who talks about people who say they can't draw. They can draw, I mean draw people. And he says there's three kinds of people you can draw, and this like blew away my mind. Um, he said that you can draw uh, stick people, and stick people are useful for showing emotional state, happy, sad, angry, because they have a big face, like Charlie Brown. Um, you can also draw block people, and block people, their face isn't the main thing, their body is the main thing, so they're doing something. They're fishing, they're running, they're hiking, their body is in the foreground. And lastly, if you draw blob people, you're drawing uh, little groups of people, little societies, relationships, and these kinds of three people are easy to draw. And I realized that that's the three kinds of design that underlie what I think we call experience design today. Because in a sense, the action world is a world of body. It's the old school world, the world of metal, plastic, wood, the ancient way of Eames design, uh, paper, brick making. All of that is the world of the body. It is where you see from full, full action in art and design schools. And then in the emotional space, you see the world of the cog sci approach to interface. Uh, because we don't use our body very much, we twitch our fingers around to see that portal happen in front of us. It's changing how we think, and so there's a world of the mind in design. And then there's a world of relationships, the world of people. Now we're interconnected. This is more of the Facebooks or the social media world where suddenly we can now connect to other people. That's a new kind of design as well. <coughs> so these three kinds of designs all have different expertises. One is physically based, one is digitally based, and one is social based. And it's the, it's, the, it's the convergence of these three kinds of design that are causing so much uh, opportunity, but also so much confusion. Um, because in a sense, these three began with the two. We began with computers intersecting with the physical world that was much in the 90s and early 2000s. And then uh, there were schools that were pushing this, whether it's MIT, or RISD, or RCA, or places knew how to combine these two together. And then the social aspect came in. The Harvard staffers became more relevant. D-school thinking brings in this sort of organizational view. So these three are coming together, and they're trying really hard. But if there's a fourth school out there, I think it is the, uh, I would call it the NYU ITP school. Just on Saturday, there was a service for this woman, uh, Ren Burns. It was a tribute for her. Who knew Ren Burns in this audience? If you don't know Ren Burns, please Google her. I think she was probably the most important person to really bring to these three, these three spaces of, 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 of design. Because Ren's whole take was, um, you don't really do technology. You do the human thing. And technology gets added in. She would always say, think of technology as a verb, not a noun. It provides the tools, greater people provide imagination. She was always people-centric, empathy-centric, never uh, clock speed-centric, never bandwidth-centric. And that perspective has been extremely sturdy, and I come back to it all the time in my work today, thanks to Red. Because if you do the Google Word Define thing, you look at the world technology, you get this little uh, graph. And it shows you that technology is really kind of a, a buzzword we've been using recently in the last 50 years. Uh, but if you look at the root of the word technology, it is the word art. And if you look at the word art, and you look at how it's been used over time, it's been very constant. And also, the origin of art is the word art. It's wonderfully recursive in that way. So art and technology are intertwined forever. Technology comes from art. How do you reconnect with art, I believe, is the question today. Because today we see art all the time. Uh, it's in a different form of variant. It's design, where technology and art collide. And it's everywhere. And people who don't understand design understand it because it's everywhere. It's so hard to see. It's like we're fish trying to see water. And if you think about, like this is my office at RISD, you know, if I look at the chair, I know it's been designed by my friend in Tokyo. Um, if I look at the lights, they're fancy light design. If I look at uh, the book design, if I look at the print designs on my wall, if I look at the computers that have been designed, I can see the tables been designed, I can
can see the carpet has been designed, and all the things on the walls have been designed. So everything I'm seeing is designed, everything you see is designed. And you go outside, and the same kind of thing happens usually, like this is outside my office at RISD. Uh, the car has been designed, the light picture has been designed, but not just that one, all of the light pictures have been designed. The facade of the building has been designed, actually all facades, and all buildings have been designed. Everything has been designed except for the sky. If you go into nature, it's the one place where you don't find design, because nature designed that. And that gives you a sense of design. It's everywhere, but how do you make that useful? How do you take design and do something with it? And a lot of the work actually today around design is a question of making details. Making details, design, the word design includes the word sign, making signs, making them, destroying them. And I'm a big believer in details and signs. And uh, um, if you think about on any given page, in any given moment, there are commas everywhere. We ignore them so easily, but commas are amazing. This is just a sample of a few commas magnified up. They're like, whoa, that comma's beautiful. You would never notice it. Like, whoa, these people have spent a lot of time on these commas. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Doesn't make any sense, but it does. Because the more and less thing is complex, you want more. 
more, when you get to enjoy more. You want less, when you have to work more. It's very simple that way. And design balances those two things together. Because design uh, was always working before computers emerged. And now that computers don't have that same impact on our experience, uh, what's happened is, um, well, what's happened is this ability for design to balance desire utility has changed. What's happened is that now because of the technology, we want more technology. We used to want everything. More technology made things easier because it would always be better. Um, if I wait 18 months, it'll be more useful. Uh, if I wait 18 months, it's going to be amazing. I'm going to love it more. And this was the way things were for so long. If you had more technology, you were happier. Better design. You never thought about design, actually. But what's happened now is that technology is still important, but what's happened is become less important. So design can be more visible again. It isn't that design is coming out of nowhere. Design has always been there. Design is how we balance this less is more equation. It's a human equation. There's no mathematical relationship. It's complex. As my HR person likes to say, it depends. So it depends, which makes it maddening sometimes. But that's why it's very human and interesting and worthwhile to pursue. And uh, I was just talking to someone, and someone was saying, is there a design bubble? It's a design bubble out there. It's growing, it's growing, growing. And I think my response was very simple. It was, uh, actually, there's no design bubble. There's a design bowling ball. What does that mean? It means that it's always been there. It didn't suddenly appear and it's growing out of nowhere. Design has been ever-present in our world. And designers know how to use that. And technology has now balanced out with where designers can now have a bigger role in it. In the old days, you'd have two technologists would hire uh, a business person and half a designer. Now you have the world where you hire, or two, de two designers will hire a uh, technologist and half a business person. So that shift is occurring only because the balance in the force has now been maintained. The design is coming back. Uh, we can all see it now in these three spaces of design. I have one minute left. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>